Good afternoon, Pastor David. It is. Welcome everybody to a random moment with Pastor David Unfiltered. You know, Pastor, the beauty of God's word is there are so many things, especially in the Old Testament, so many things that we see Jesus teaching us as he's leading his disciples or he's rebuking the Pharisees. And, and oftentimes we come across a passage that because we live in the Western part of the world, we view things through a Western perspective. But there are stories in the Bible, or even things that Jesus has said, that it really doesn't have the, tr we don't get the true meaning of it unless we look at it through a Middle Eastern perspective. That helps. One of them being the prodigal son. And recently you and I were, actually yesterday we were talking about this and you shared something with me that was amazing. And, and a lot of times people, when they look at the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, they see that repentance comes when the son has said, Father, I have sinned against you. Would that be the place in this passage or in this story that Jesus gives or this parable, is that the true part part of repentance? Well, see, actually, that's what he says when he is repentant. But prior to that, he said, what should I do? This is what I will do. Uh, and he had concocted a plan. And so uh, let me share how, again, I'll kind of, uh, we'll visit once more over that, because it is, it is a touching thing when you consider the insights that uh, the ancient church really added to that and gave to us if we uh, if we took the opportunity to actually uh, investigate um, yeah the western church has normally seen that um, repentance was in, when he says uh, that I have uh, uh, you know I have to work eating, you know, have to eat pig's food, what should I do? And they think, oh, I'll just go back. And they say, well, that's his point of repentance. But what happens is that a young man approaches his father and he says, give to me the things that belong to me, which was a, a great insult. You, you, a son was never to, to make a demand of a father, though he could legitimately give to him that which was his, should he desire. The idea that the son would come in such a way and say, give that which is mine to me now, was a great insult to the father because that was an inheritance that was to come at the, upon the father's death. So in asking for his share of the inheritance in an early way, it was another way of saying, um, I can't wait for you to die. I want to go out and live my life. And so that's man, that's how man is. I want to live my life without you and without anything um, to do with you, God. And so, yeah, so he leaves, he goes to a foreign land, begins to take an occupation of, of feeding uh, pigs. He, so he's obviously in a Gentile um, portion of the world, and he's so hungry that he desires to eat from the pods that he's normally feeding the pigs. And so that's when he begins to say, you know, in my father's house, there are many servants and uh, what should I do? I mean, they're eating better than I am. And so he, he creates a plan. He says, this is what I'll do. I'll just go home. And I'll say to my father, um, you treat me like a servant. What he was really doing at that point though, was he was buying himself some time. He was getting some job training, if you will. So he could go out once again into the world and continue the way that he had. But what had happened upon his, his leaving the fact that he had insulted his father in this way caused the, the community elders to gather together in the Middle Eastern way and to form a council. They called it the Katsatsa. And they put together a council and made a declaration. They, they had a ceremony burning some acorns in a pot and things of that nature. And then they said, this person is banished forever from this community. So he had been cut off. And that's a picture of his sin. He's cut off now from the father and the community. And so should he return, that council had authority to, to well, one, banish him, you know, to stop him from entering in. But also, uh, depending on the, the gravity of the situation, could have done him harm, possibly even... Um, seen him die and so when he makes this plan to return to his father you know he 
he begins to make his way home, this is when I'll say he has his plan, make me as a servant, give me some job training. That's really what he's doing. Um, we see a picture of the father and the father is waiting for him and sees the son coming up the road, <laughs> up the road and he runs to him and he pulls his robe so that he doesn't trip himself, which is a picture of the humiliation, the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ humbling himself to embrace a sinner. And he chases him and runs after him, chases him and runs after him, catches him before he enters the village. Because in embracing him, he's keeping the village, the village elders from enacting any penalties upon the son. So he clothes him in himself and and in saving him from the judgment wow. and and so that's when the real repentance happens and seeing the voluntary humiliation of the father to embrace him and to 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 welcome him home that's when the real the real uh, repentance because originally he had he had rehearsed his speech you know i I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me a servant was his speech. But this time he said, I've, I've sinned against you. And that was it. That was his confession. Prior, I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But that was a plan. Make me a servant was part of his plan. But when he said, I have sinned against you, that was the repentance. And that, that's when the father and his love embraced his son, and the son came to realize his great sin and the welcoming embrace of a forgiving father. And that is so powerful when you hear it that way, because even as a parent, the great lengths that we would do as a parental love to our children, that we would go and embrace them and protect them from harm. And, you know, yesterday you were sharing this with me, and it was emotional because I'm a parent. And I think about my little boy, my little girl. You're a parent, Pastor, and you think about your children and how, as a parent, we would do the same thing to now reflect that and seeing that's Jesus' ultimate love, God's ultimate love for us. I have seen pictures of mothers who under fire in the Middle East and there, <laughs> there are shots being fired. Uh, I have seen, not only in the Middle East, but also in other countries, pictures of mothers who have actually uh, blanketed their children with their own body, laying over the babies, wow. you know, to take the bullets upon themselves. That is what God did for us, is he, he embraced us to take the judgment upon himself. And then any true father, any true father, will want to, would take the punishment upon himself. You know, um, I have, I, I, my dad said to me when my mother was very ill, I've asked God to give me her illness. Wow. Give me her illness. I can take it. My dad told me that. Put it on me, you know, take it off her. And so, if we in a, in a human way, If we in a human way would say, I'll, I'll bear the pain myself, Lord. How much more? How much more? When my God voluntarily humbled himself, took upon himself the form of a man and died on a cross, right? And so that's the picture. The Muslims would use the parable of the um, prodigal and say, well, there's no incarnation. There's... There's no cross. Uh, and they actually, in debates against Christian scholars, the Muslim scholars would use that parable to say atonement doesn't have to occur because there's no cross or incarnation or the things that pertain to Christian faith. How can you use that? It's because they were, they were apparently uh, neglecting to understand or remember those elements that Jesus would be referring to, you know, in the voluntary humiliation in the embrace and taking upon himself and protecting that one and offering forgiveness. And when that young man says, I have sinned against you, the instant grace of God, it's all there. 
And so the Christian scholars during the uh, Middle Ages, when they would debate the Muslim scholars who would, would say all of these things about that parable of the prodigal, the no, the the scholars, the Christian scholars would point these things out. You know, and the fact that the man raised his skirt and ran. No, no Middle Eastern man would do that. And the fact is, a Middle Eastern father would expect that son to come to his house and in front of everybody to beg forgiveness before he'd even consider it. Before he'd even, for, you know, consider forgiving him. You've insulted me and you've brought dishonor upon me. That was the Middle Eastern mentality. And that's still here in a variety of forms. You did it. You did it against me and you come and you let everybody know you made me ashamed in front of the community. Now you, you know, you, you apologize in front of the community. And the father didn't do that because the father knew his son's heart. And that's why the father is waiting. He knew the son's heart. One day the son's going to come back to me and I'm not going to turn him away. And, and I have to protect him from the judgment that's to come. And he did, you know, he runs and, and he grabs him and he holds him. Father, I have sent, slay the fatty calf. You know, that's all it takes is for you to say, I have sinned and I can see that you've repented, yeah. right? What a, what a beautiful picture. Powerful. Pastor, what would you say to those who are maybe watching or listening right now who do have a son or a daughter that's a prodigal? Love them. Pray for them. Never stop praying, you know? I believe that no matter how godly a person may be, uh, that doesn't mean that their children will be. You know, you, there are too many examples in scripture of of sons who, who refuse their father, you know, um, Saul's boys and, you know, so many others, David's sons. There are so many others that, there were godly men who had ungodly children but what do you do? You know, sometimes your kids will go through a a stretch where they're trying to find themselves, be their own person. One of my kids told me, Dad, I need not your testimony. I need my own. I didn't appreciate hearing it at that time. And I had done everything I could to keep them from having a testimony like mine. Sometimes children are bent on forming their own testimonies. But you never give up. You never stop praying. You never stop loving. And you know the funny thing, John? I'll close with this little thought here, this little tidbit, is the church isn't always as forgiving as they should be. Because when they see that somebody's child is not doing well, very often what they do is judge the parent for it. And surely this person isn't really the person they appear to be because look at their children. The only ones I think who have a legitimate reason to think that, not to say that's right, is the ones who don't have their own children. Because I don't know a single person, not a single person, who is a father or mother who has raised a perfect child. I don't know a single one. And so in a time when they're going through so much pain, it, it's important to have their friends there with them, loving them and encouraging them through it. And, and unfortunately, John, um, and I'll be real with you on this one. Um, when my children went through tough times and broke my heart, it was harder sometimes dealing with the members who at one time thought would say to me how much they loved me and I was their father in the faith. And all of a sudden they're disappearing to go to a, a church apparently that is pastored by a perfect pastor who never admits his faults to anybody and uh, I learned some things about the church that I knew but I never thought my church was made up of people who could do that and indeed I learned some things every church is filled with people who don't know what grace is every church is filled with people that uh, can misunderstand a person's heart. But you know what? When you have friends who love you and you have um, you have a mate like I do who can pray with you and pray together for, my children who 
who went astray for a while have returned to the Lord. And uh, and I'm blessed to see that. So you, you don't let go no matter what, John. You hold on to the very end. You know, there have been times where pastors have actually died praying for the children, never seeing them come back. And at the pastor's funeral, the children come back to the Lord. His prayers were answered. He just didn't have a chance to see it on earth. So you hold on. You never let go. And uh, and bless God when you have people around you who, who love you and your children too. Amen, Pastor. That father never stopped looking. Fathers never stop. Real fathers never stop loving and never stop waiting and never stop hoping and are always ready to intervene and to help. Pastor, thank you. That was powerful. And uh, I hope you guys really enjoyed this. I want to invite you guys to our Sunday morning service at 830 and 1045. Uh, Pastor David, you're taking us to Mark chapter four. four. We're looking at the parable of the mustard seed. I'm going oh. to give two different applications to that because... Some believe that the parable of the mustard seed speaks of the extreme growth of the church over the years through its history, and others give a different view of that. So I'll give both, and then I'll share what I think it's saying. That's, I remember, yes, that's going to be good. Invite your friends and family to come on out for that. Uh, also, those who are registered to go to Israel or interested in going to Israel, we have our uh, meeting with Inspired Travel this Sunday, October 24th, after second service in the sanctuary yep even if you have questions uh come check it out yep and uh, we'll look forward to having you and pastor again thank you so much for your time and for the insight that you've given us this is a very powerful passage it and, truly is and uh and we're thankful so much for god's grace and Amen. for waiting on even on us at least me right? that's what it's for right that's <laughs> what the parable of the, yes. we're all prodigals yes and so pastor thank you so much god bless you guys we'll see you and thank you for tuning in